this talk contains comparison with uh, comparisons with React um, and also includes notable reasons wh why Vue is a great framework to use. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Vue 2 and 3 and the current ecosystem. Um, we're on a journey at the moment to move to Vue 3 um, and there's still, there's still a long way to go. Um, I'll touch it briefly um, upon getting started with Vue.js Vue in terms of very specific kind of things you can do. And yeah, and this talk does contain opinions, my opinions, uh, for sure. And uh, th what this talk doesn't contain, um, I, I simply don't have the time to go into the, like the, ba the basics of JavaScript frameworks and kind of where they're useful and, and kind of where how best to use them. Um, I, I also don't have a huge amount of code examples here. Obviously, I'm very fortunate that my counterpart is doing a very code related presentation. Um, so hopefully all the pressure, <laughs> he has all the pressure of that and I don't have any, which is uh, good for me. Um, yeah, I don't go too much into server side rendering as well for, for, for that reason. Um, and yeah, and you know, my talk isn't a hundred percent, um, praising of you because there are, there are areas which I think. I think could be improved. Um, just before I start, just just on a very surface level, um, I think it's worth just saying about a JavaScript framework that, um, you know, my interpretation of a good JavaScript framework is that it provides um, a structure to build your project on, and it will make certain decisions for you around things like data reactivity. Um, so reactivity is ultimately why um we you know we want to use javascript frameworks um you know for example we want to get data display it the data might change um and then the framework will react to that change we don't want to build you know the code for that we want to kind of pass that to view uh, and the like um of course it's worth pointing out obviously i'm going to talk about react there are many other frameworks um you know there are no right there are no wrong answers here and um, but ultimately your choice of framework you know really is based on your you know your team skill set um priorities and obviously things like documentation um i'm ha very happy to discuss and take questions um after the talk so yeah just very briefly about myself um i'm a front-end consultant um i won't bore you with the list of people i've worked with but i've i've been working now for 15 years um in just just you know being completely transparent in the open, um, my day rate um, is roughly around four hundred and fifty pounds a day. Um, that is what I've kind of been taking for view projects. Obviously, we live in strange times right now in terms of in terms of obviously everyone's react uh, yeah, everyone's remote by default, um, so the rates are fluctuating. But that's kind of where I sit um, for reference. Um, and then, yeah, I've just briefly composed, um, I've just, uh, what based, this is my last five years of development, what I've spent my time on. So the majority is absolutely, um, view. Um, but yeah, I've also spent time with React and Angular. Um, so yeah, so let's, let's talk about React. I appreciate this is a view talk, but there's no, there's no point talking about view in isolation react is the market leader. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Um, React is, is, is great. In all, you know, it's a fantastic framework. Um, JSX is, is, is really great. Um, state while revalidating is something I'm using at the moment is, is incredible um, to um, essentially mutate data um, before you actually receive the data, um, which is just an incredible and, and for performance is, is, a, is, is amazing. Um, and obviously the contract and perm market for React is, is, in, is incredible right now. But there are, there are some downsides to React. React is very much by Facebook for Facebook. Um, they very much roadmap in the dark. Um, we don't really know what the future of React is going to be. We don't really know how Facebook treats React in terms of the business. We know there's a small core team, but we don't know how, how long they will be sustained and how long they'll be supported in, in, in Facebook. Um, and we've had this in the past where the community's vision is different to Facebook's vision, for example, uh, very notably 
uh, with the patent problem um, of about two years ago, I think it was now, um, where essentially Facebook wanted to patent certain aspects of React. And uh, yeah, and that was a difficult time for everyone involved. Um, Vue, where, 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 how does Vue differ? Vue is um, community driven. Um, it is by far the largest independent JavaScript framework, um, which I think is, is incredible. It's, it's very much in the open and the roadmap is very clear. Um, it is, it, you know, it is very much for the, for the community and the, and the photo on the right um, demonstrates, you know, it, how it's backed. It's backed financially by, you know, amazing companies and individuals who, who give the give their money. Of course, there is, there is a financial risk to that or potential financial risk. If, you know, things change, you know, uh, uh, the economy changes. Um, we've seen this with Babel recently where Babel is very incredibly well supported, but is essentially running out of money. Um, it's only fair for transparency to, to, to mention it. Um, also as well, talk about- I'm not sure I understand. Thanks, Siri. Um, talking about um, React as well. Um, React has, you know, a great path to build mobile hybrid apps. Um, Vue three has Ionic, um, as does React, and I'm I'm personally a huge fan of Ionic. Um, I use it quite a lot. But React Native's libraries, um, you know, are second to none. Um, you know, there's a lot of things which are officially supported libraries, whereas something like Ionic um, is very much kind of community wrappers uh, around kind of existing existing libraries, which may or may not be supported. Um, Vue does have mobile options here. It has, for example, Vue Native, but they're so early. I, I, I you know, they're so early and kind of in their infancy, I, I can't, I wouldn't actively recommend them. So I feel like this matters if you have a small development team and, you, and your mobile is an option in the sense of, you know, you don't have the staff, um, potentially the dedicated mobile staff, you know, it's something to keep keep an eye on. Um, however, Vue um, has a much clearer ecosystem. Um, I call it kind of batteries included, uh, optional batteries <laughs> included. Um, you know, with things like state management, routing, static site generation, it's much clearer what to use with Vue. Um, for me as an individual, I, I don't really want to waste my time making decisions about front end architecture in the sense of what libraries should I be using. So for example, React, if you talk about state management has Redux, uh, MobX, Recoil, Hooks themselves. You know, there's many different frameworks, whereas uh, as we see here, if you want to use Vue, you, you'll start at the top. If you, just need to, if you just need to simply have reactivity, you can just use Vue in isolation, which is, which is fantastic. Um, for example, that's a good use case for if you may have kind of a typical NVC type backend where you don't have single page app support. You've kind of got that traditional backend structure where you have kind of pages. You may just want to put discrete little apps of functionality um, or kind of micro apps of functionality. But if you want to move beyond that, um, your decision's made for you in the sense of you're going to, you, you, you use view router and view meta um, for the page metadata. And, you, and you'll have an SPA there. Um, state management, of course, you know, it's a, bit, it's a big thing. Um, I'll put that aside for a second, um, but we'll come back to it. Um, if you, as a developer, if, if you want to, to learn Vue, if you pick these top four things, you know, um, this, this is pretty much the entirety of the stack. This will, you'll, you'll be able to pick up the vast majority of projects um, easily because there is, there isn't that much variance in the ecosystem, which I personally really enjoy. Of course, there are kind of uh, supplementary um, libraries you can use. So for example, uh, Viewsify is, is a fantastic UI framework. Um, there's also things like Axios, um, which is obviously a bit more generic across frameworks, but if you want to do API requests, you can use things like that. Um, there's also Vulidate. Um, sorry, excuse my typo there. There's also Vulidate um, for form validation and Vue inter uh, for internalization. Um, 
of course, there's Nuxt as well, um, which we're obviously we'll talk about uh, later on. Um, this stack is very solid. This will this will take all the all of your functionality quite easily. And yeah, and just to jump back to VUX there, um, what what the nice thing about it is, it, it if you want state management, you'll use VUX. Um, that's great. Um, but what I would say as a general piece of advice for people starting out is don't put in VUX by default. Um, absolutely start your app development um, and start your you start your app. Um, you'll know when you need to use state management. Essentially, if you're doing a lot of property traversal, if you're passing data backwards and forwards to components, um, anything which is, for example, more than one level deep, so if you've got like a parent page, there may be a component and a component within that, that's probably the time where you where, where VUX becomes important. Um, and also as well on that note, don't put everything into state by default. Um, VUX works best when it's absolutely minimal. Um, but yeah, just to, just to carry on with that. When you're yeah. making the decision about, uh, yeah. So, sorry to interrupt, but just before you move on from that, uh, Simeon has a great question. Uh, do Does Vue have a pre-built template system, a bit uh, like uh, Create React app? Yes, it does, yeah. So um, I, I touched briefly upon this later on, but um, there are essentially two um, boilerplates you can use. Um, there's Vue CLI, um, which is fantastic. It, it will include everything you need. Um, to get running, um, it gives you many different options as well. So, for example, you can say you want to include UX or, or you know, for example, TypeScript. Um, it's really simplistic to, to get going with. Um, it is, it's essentially installing uh, Vue CLI globally and then running a command. Um, there is another option as well, which I'll talk about later on, using uh, Vite. Um, v is kind of V is very new. It's a new way of bundling JavaScript, and V is incredible. Um, I won't go too much into it now, just because I've got a slide on it later. But there are absolutely options to get going very quickly. I would say, personally, arguably superior to Create React app because it allows much more flexibility. Vue CLI, for example, because you can customize the config quite easily without ejecting the app, for example. Um, but yeah, if that's okay, I'll just carry on because um, obviously I'm conscious of time as well. Um, when making a decision about any framework, um, including Vue, um, don't worry about framework benchmark and don't worry about synthetic benchmarks. Um, React, Vue, Angular, so well optimized at this point. Um, there's, there's no there's no point directly comparing them against each other because they're so well optimized. You know, time to interactive. Is it should be your key metric. Um, but for example, if you put you know many different ad trackers or analytics providers in, then any sort of kind of micro optimization advantage you have from certain frameworks will, will be lost. Um, and yeah, and, and a little bit blunter with that, I'm afraid. If your app is slow, it's probably 99.9% .9 your fault it's not gonna be the framework's fault. Uh, I'm sorry to say that. Um, if you wanna start out in Vue, um, absolutely have time to experiment and do trial and error in terms of like component architecture and the like. Um, you know, I've been involved in replatforming projects which were because of speed, um, you know, a lack of, of speed, but ultimately the real issues are typically kind of lack of training, kind of lack of course budget, you know, tutorial budget and kind of, just not enough time to get used to the frameworks. Um, or, however, if you've come from React, um, use both. You, you, why, why don't you use JSX? Um, JSX is a wonderful um, template and language um, to essentially write, yeah, you write your HTML in, in JavaScript. You could absolutely use JSX in Vue, especially for Vue 3. Um, but be but be warned about this um, because one of Vue's strengths is its separation of concerns. That you have a dedicated template block, dedicated style block, and dedicated logic block. Um, so yeah, so it's a really interesting time to be to be interested in Vue. Um, 
I'm yeah, I've I've been very fortunate to use View for View Two for a number of years now, and um, kind of my world's been turned upside down by the composition API, um, which is which has been introduced. Um, I was very um, all the talk about View Three is 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 dominated by the composition API, which uh, which we'll briefly go into now. Um, but yeah, so when we talk about View Two and do, View Three. Um, View 3 is absolutely ready to use now um, as a core product. It is, it is ready to go. It is fantastic. But the ecosystem around it is very much a uh, work in progress. Um, so just to explain this a little bit more, um, View 3 um, View three has been updated with a uh, new version of View X, which fully supports View 3. Same with View Router, which is great. But for example, um, View Meta, which I, talked, uh, which I mentioned before about metadata, um ha is in alpha and that is pretty much the, the where we're at at the moment where you can use the core view product really well but the ecosystem you're probably going to be using alpha and be a maybe release candidate um products and you've just got to be mindful of that um so yeah, View 3 is all about the composition API. Um, there are, of course, other improvements to, 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 with View 3, um, such as improved TypeScript support. But, um, all, but ultimately, yeah, when you move to View 3, you're moving to the composition API. You can still use the options API, which is the V2 way of doing things. That is absolutely fully supported in View 3. But who knows how long that will be supported um alongside so i'm gonna i'm gonna do a little bit of a code dive here for for the for the um for the composition api so this example this wonderful example is taken from the view uh, official view documentation um so this this component on the left um is uh, a view to show the list of repositories of a certain user um and it also applies some searching and filtering. Um, this code doesn't show the actual templating uh, um, or styling um, just for the purposes of time. Um, so a couple of differences from view two um, here is um, the usage of um, setup. Setup um, is essentially a function which is the first thing which runs. So even if you're new, if you're new to View Three or coming from View Two, setup is your baseline. This, um, as a View Two equivalent, this runs before created, um, and this is where essentially you put your boilerplate in for a component. Um, something different for View Three, which is important to note, is the usage of refs. So if we look to the right of the screen, um, uh, we look at the top right, which is um, uh, compo uh, composable. So we can see that um, there's a ref here. And what this ref is doing, this is saying that this piece of data, it could be an array, um, could be an object, doesn't matter, but this is going to be reactive. So what that means is that this data can change and that's important for the app to know that that data has changed. So to use this example, this function is getting, um, is getting uh, the user repositories. So we have our repositories, which is a blank array, um, which is again being made reactive. We have a function to get um, get the data. Um, and what's interesting here as well is that we see where the lifecycle has changed from view two, um, where it's kind of new for, uh, and where if you're new to view, where um, kind of one of the main kind of almost functions of view where you can say on various different life cycles what to do. So for example, on mounted is when this component is first included onto a page. Um, so what, what's happening here? So, so this component, has, sorry, this composable, I should say, apologies, has no understanding of where it is in the app. It doesn't need to understand where it is. Its only purpose here is to pass repository data um, so but so what you're saying here is whenever this composable is used in the app for the first time i want you to get the user repositories so what it's also showing as well here is when 
the parent data changes, um, I want you to get the user repositories again. So what's happening here is user is typically an ID in this case, which is going to be passed into the component. Um, if that user ID changes, so for example, if you go to another page or to another user, um, automatically view is smart enough to know that the user's changed. I need to get new data and pass that back to, to the parent. So for example, if you have like a drop down of users and you change that on the parent, you, this, this will change. This is, this is a, a textbook example of reactivity. Um, and yeah, and it's, and, it, and it's really cool. So you'll notice very quickly um, that, yeah, so we're using this uh, use user repositories um, composable. Um, but what's great is because we're still in the setup phase, we can now filter that data before the user sees anything. So we're, that, we're now using uh, the uh, uh, repository name search, which is simply matching repositories to whatever the user's search term was. Um, I appreciate this is a very short, uh, shallow dive into the code, but it's what I'm trying to demonstrate here is how much you can do, how reusable you can make your code with, with Vue 3. You can definitely do this with Vue 2, but very much with the composition API, how reusable the code is um, and how clean that code is. So what, so what we see here is that essentially the data has been, uh, been uh, received, the repository data, and it's now being filtered, and then it's then returned essentially to the template and rendered. So, so incredibly quick, incredibly reactive, re really nice. Um, it's worth pointing out at this point, it's perfectly fine to use Vue 2. It's actually perfectly fine to choose Vue 2 now. Um, there's some very good reasons why you should use Vue 2 at this point. Um, Vue 2 is actually getting a new version, 2.7, with some of the backported improvements from Vue 3. And you can actually use the composition API in Vue 2. So I'm going to make just do some quick decisions here about because it may be because we're in this transition period of which framework to use. Um, so brand new project. And you're going to build a bit bespoke UI. Not going to not going to use a UI framework. I would absolutely say use Vue three. Vue three is, is is the future. Um, you can use the options I if you really wanted to, but I wouldn't recommend that for a new project. Um, absolutely go with Vue three. Do you need to use a UI framework? This is where it gets a little bit more complicated. I would recommend at this time to use Vue two with the composition API. Um, the reason why I say that is Vuetify is probably one of, is probably the main UI framework. It's a great framework. I, I use it a lot myself. Um, Vuetify 3 um, is in development, um, but it's in alpha at this point. And in terms of debugging issues, my experience tells me that UI is where, is where you'll get a lot of your issues. Um, so if you're working with an alpha framework, is very much you know at your at your own risk. So I would probably say use if you need a UI framework, use Vue two, but use the Composition API now. So then, when your framework is ready to move to Vue three, you can move to Vue three with little little, little issues. Um, or do using Vue two, um, for example, an existing project <laughs> could go either way with this one. Um, there is a migration build on its way, which will, when you run that build, it will tell you um, things you'll need to change for V3. Um, that isn't here yet. Um, there's also considerations, do you, do you use TypeScript? Um, you may want to simplify um, your code base by moving to the Composition API, which has a much better, much improved support for TypeScript. But you know, the, the great thing is, you know, with Vue 3 that it still supports the options API. You could do it piecemeal, maybe, for example, drawing component refactors. Um, but ultimately, that decision is, is yours. Uh, I11 support, um, you're, you're on Vue 2 forever, um, unfortunately. Um, obviously, my point would be, do you, do you really need to do this? Um, I11 is end of support um this year uh <laughs> finally 
Um, you know, I would suggest looking at alternatives. You know, can you sandbox an app? Could you produce like a light version for i11? Um, but ultimately, if you need to support i11, you need to pick stability. So stick with the options API, stick with Vue 2. Uh, want to use Next.js? Um, I will let Daniel talk about that in more detail. And then, um, yeah, and then just a quick thing about getting started. Um, you can use Vue CLI or Vite, as I previously mentioned. Um, Vite is fast. It is so incredibly fast. It is unreal. Vite is a smaller package than Vue CLI. Vue CLI contains a lot. It's really customizable. You can, it, there's, there's also a great ecosystem for Vue CLI itself to, for example, include uh, Sentry. Error monitoring, for example, is something I use Vue CLI for. Um, but V is great. Uh, Vue CLI supports Vue 2 or 3. So you can use Vue CLI as a baseline to experiment with, whereas Vite officially at this point just supports Vue 3 at the moment. Um, and then, yeah, just to use Vite as an example, um, you can, if you, assuming you have Node uh, 12 or 14 LTS installed, um, you can run that command, don't need to install anything else, and that will produce a Vue 3 app for you um, uh, and a template ready to go. And then, yes, yeah, so, 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 so to summarize, Vue is incredibly scalable. Um, you can go from just you know small micro apps within bigger pages right, all the way up to single page apps, all the way to server-side rendering. Um, it's, it's a fantastic framework. Vue takes away a lot of the decision processes around front-end architecture because it has such a, a tight ecosystem. Um, you know, you'll pick Vue X at state management, and that's kind of the end of the conversation. Um, I would suggest to use Vue 3 at po uh, if possible at this point. Um, but if you can't, use, use the composition API in Vue 2. And then finally, just in terms of resource, um, I cannot stress enough how Vue School all Vue Mastery are incredible. And they have great resources from working with Vue 2, working with Vue 3, TypeScript, uh, workflows, everything, <laughs> everything I don't have time to talk about. And, um, and that's me. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Uh, I'm more than happy to take questions. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Bill. Um, I, we, we had a question from Simeon in the chat uh, asking about other APIs that are being supported. So stuff like um, Vue Router, Vue X, that sort of thing. Is, is that um, like uh, how, how well have they been migrated to Vue 3? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, Vue Router and Vue X have full support for Vue3 now. They've both been uh, updated. Um, Vue X is an interesting one because they have done essentially a one-to-one -one, um, migration to Vue3. So if you know the Vue X API, it's, it hasn't changed fundamentally. There are uh, for um, for view uh, for view x5 um there's talk about imp um do uh, making breaking changes and, and streamlining the api which i think will be really exciting because one of the things that will do is bring much improved typescript support so yeah absolutely view root and view x are ready to go right now Cool. Yeah, it's a really. It's a, I, I I knew that there was some thorniness around migrating from Vue two to Vue three, but it, it was great to get an explanation for why that is. And it's it's fascinating to hear that that whereas sort of Vue three is really ready to go, like it's this this surrounding ecosystem, um, that that's not quite there, and it's it's a it makes it a tricky decision. Thanks for your decision tree. That, that helped clarify what we should use and when. But yeah, um, does anyone else want to? Yeah, sorry, go on, Phil. No, no, I was just going to say very quickly. Um, you know, the community ecosystem has kind of used this time to essentially do a lot of refactoring. So it's like we'll move to the composition API, or actually we'll, you know, refactor our kind of plugin or you know uh, module now, which is great. It's absolutely great. But obviously there is that latency between Vue three essentially being finalized and and the and the ecosystem and ultimately it's it's you know it you have to kind of bring in your own risk mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. Uh, we've got a question from James Cowan. Can can both View Two and View Three be used without a build step like Webpack? Yes. Yes. Uh, both both uh, solutions um, completely support you just pulling in, for example, a script um, from from the web and um, code sandbox as well. For example, um, you can use um, just for quick, uh, you know, rapid kind of R and D um, and prototyping. Um, but yeah, um, absolutely. You can just pull in um, just yeah, script tag, view three or view two, and it will work fine. Same with Vuex and Vue as well. Cool. And one one more question from Furkan before we move on. Can can you use Nuxt with Vue three? Maybe this is something that will come from uh, uh, from from Daniel. But do you know about that? I I do know. So um, you well. <laughs> I, I don't know the full extent of it, and Daniel will be much better place for it, but I know that you can use Next, uh, Nuxt, sorry, Nuxt. I've been working with React lately, I'm sorry. Um, you can use Nuxt uh, with the Composition API. They're, they have a plugin for that, which is great, and, and Nuxt 3 is on its way, which has uh, full View 3 support. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, big round of applause that, again, you can't really hear, unfortunately, but, but the love is there. Um, we're going to move move on now from now we have a good general overview of you and how it works. We're going to move on to, to Daniel Rowe and he's going to talk to us about next year. So please give, give Daniel a big welcome. I can see the emojis popping up. Over to you, Daniel. Uh, thanks very much. Um, Hey everyone, it's uh, it's amazing to be virtually in Brighton, and you know that's pretty cool for me. I'm up in the northeast, so obviously Brighton is only a dream. Uh, we can only imagine uh, here in the northeast the the wonderful sunshine, the beaches, all of that. Um, and I feel somehow I'm closer uh, to it. Uh, so thanks for inviting me. Um, please interrupt me. Uh, Dropped questions in, uh, and and Alistair, just please do. Uh, doesn't matter what I'm saying; it can't be that interesting. If someone has a question, just just fire it at me. Um, be quite quite fun. Uh, before we get started, and I share my screen, and we just dive into the code. Uh, could I have an idea how many people have used Vue before? Just um, I, in the in the chat, you could uh, say something, or you could. Um, Okay, so a few people. And um, if anyone's used uh, Nuxt before in particular, if you could just sort of type Nuxt or something like that. <laughs> Does Nuxt count? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, absolutely not. The, the power of a single letter. Um, Nuxt is great though. But uh, it's not not the same as next. That's really helpful. That's really good to know. Um, so uh, we'll be coming from all kinds of, of different different backgrounds. Let me um, let me dive dive straight in. Uh, show my screen. Uh, and from now on, you are invisible to me. Only Alistair can convey your messages uh, to me. So uh, great. Let's dive into next. Now, what what I should say as we get started uh, with next is. What is it? So if uh, Vue.js is a framework for JavaScript, uh, Nuxt is a framework for Vue. So it exists to make uh, the lives of developers who are using Vue easier and simpler. So Nuxt calls itself a progressive framework, which means that you, should, you don't need to know anything to get started. So it should just work from the first moment. And as you do more things will need more customization. You should be able to do that. It should be entirely within your grasp. Um, so we're going to start just in exactly that kind of way with nothing. So I'm going to create a folder, call it async. And we'll create a uh, blank get repo and we'll create a blank uh, package JSON and I'll fire that up. Um, so I trust it. Absolutely, I trust it. Um, so what we're going to do um, with this folder is just add a single dependency, uh, Nux. Um, and what that's going to do, say again? You've used a, a, an alias there. What is C dot? 
uh, C, it, it, I've just um, aliased that to my Visual Studio Code instance. Oh, code, um, and, right. okay. And, and the, the dot uh, is the current directory. Sure. So um, it, will, it will just open that, open that up. Okay, great. We've installed, um, we've installed, uh, uh, we've installed uh, Nuxt. So I can actually just start it now. So if I run yarn Nuxt, that will just um, fire it up. Um, we've got nothing. So there's nothing really to, to show, but what it does is it fires up a dev server, um, which is on, in this case, on Nokia's 3000. Uh, and you can see we've got a blank, empty page. Um, if at any point you want to start an apps project, by the way, with a little bit more than this, um, three ways. One is you can fire a web-based project. If you go to template.nuxjs.org, you can create a Nux project uh, in code on sandbox. That will um, fire up a, a bit fuller Nux project with lots of directories and files, all of which I'm going to explain um, this evening. Uh, if you want to do that in your browser, you can do that. Um, there's a similar one, uh, StackBits uh, has a Nux start as well. StackBits is pretty cool. Uh, it actually runs entirely in your browser in, uh, in WebAssembly code, um, your entire node environment. Um, so that's just downloaded Nux and uh, started it up super fast. So happy to talk about that later if you want, but here we go. This is a blank Nux project with no uh, installations, no, with nothing there. So um, initially, the way everything works for Nuxt is that you have a uh, is that you have a folder um, called Pages, uh, and in this folder called Pages, you can stick all of your uh, routes, all the pages you you want to visit. So we'll start with an index.view, and we will stick a blank view component, uh, and if I save that. Um, you'll see it detects that it's now there. This is all part module reloading, um, except that on this occasion, I will just refresh the page to start with because it's the first, first thing. From this point onward, I can uh, save something and it will automatically appear on the page. Doesn't look very nice though at the moment because I've got no CSS. Um, now you'll see what's happening um, if I uh, have a look at the source, uh, you'll see that we actually have HTML being served up. So one of the things that people often think about uh, when they think of Nuxt is the fact that it's a server-side rendering framework. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it can produce uh, SPA, but it does produce HTML if you want, and that's what it does out of the box, which is great for SEO um, or for other uh, situations where you need that super fast initial response. So the moment the HTML arrives in your browser, the browser can start downloading the necessary scripts to render the page or add interactivity rather. Uh, it can also start rendering the page with CSS. You'll see that all the CSS we need to render the page is already inlined in it. Uh, and obviously um, there's no gap, no loader, no white screen before anything starts happening. Um, so the code is just there to start with. Um, we can customize uh, pretty much all of that. So if I were to um, create a new file, um, we'll and uh, create a Nuxt config file, Nuxt config, uh, .js. Uh, and we'll just do a couple of tiny, um, I'll just configure the default uh, headers, um, uh, the, the head tags of this Nuxt.js app. We'll add a, uh, a link, uh, and this is going to be a um, style sheet, and we'll give it something that looks a little bit nicer than my default page. There we go, that looks a bit better. Um, okay, so now with Nuxt, uh, as you want to build out your app, um, you just create pages. So if I want an about page, I'll create an about page here. Um, stick some, some stuff in there, that's about. Um, and if I go to my browser and visit about, you'll see my about page works. So this is a, basically a seamless integration with View Router, which um, obviously we've heard mentioned already. Uh, this means you don't need to set it up. Um, each page you have in your app in this pages directory is automatically bundle split. So the code necessary to render that page in the browser and add interactivity is separated out uh, when you actually build your app so that uh, as your app gets bigger and your pages um, grow, um, you don't suffer any loss of performance. 
Um, um, Daniel, just sorry, just just quickly, we've had a uh, had a lot of love for, for the font that that you're using. <laughs> what, what is that font? Uh, I'm using Dank Mono. Dank Mono. Uh, oh, okay. nice. Dank, I think you can find it at dank.sh. Okay. Oh, very. Cool. I, I promise I'm not I'm not a salesman for them, but uh, okay. yes, I I like it. And sorry, can you just show the um, the CSS? It was was it newcss.com slash light? Yes, newcss.net forward slash light.css. Sorry to interrupt, carry on. Okay, so um, so yes, so we've got uh, our about page, and everything that's needed for that page, components and things, can be bundle split. Um, we can create some more uh, special folders um, in here, but before we do. Um, you might be wondering what this .nuxt folder is. This is basically the uh, app that Nuxt builds for you. So if you have a look in there, um, it, it's not Git committed, by the way. It's, it's purely dynamic. Um, it's generated just uh, for my dev server. And uh, if I were to build the app, it would, it would do something similar. But you can see all of the, the JavaScript that you might normally add, um, all the boilerplate that you might need for a normal Vue.js app. And basically, Nuxt takes care of all of that for you. It generates that based on what you need. So for example, here's the router code. Um, we are importing the router, we are view using it, we are creating a list of routes. We have some, um, uh, they're all uh, lazy loaded. You see that we've got some dynamic imports there and we've got some more configuration. Uh, and that's true for every page in that directory. Um, if you ever want to see how much Nuxt is doing for you, um, that directory is a good place to start. Um, Nuxt does a number of other things that might be quite useful. So you might want a layout, for example. Um, you can simply create a, a page and say, this is my uh, clever Nuxt app. Uh, and then actually we just add a Nuxt element. Um, and now this default layout is going to be wrapped around every page in my app. Um, I, can do, I can do the same with other pages. So I can um, basically create more layouts. Um, and uh, basically, uh, I could create something called um, uh, you know, admin and then have an admin layout, which would enable me to add some extra admin styles or something like that. Um, you can also create a folder called store, uh, which will enable Vuex. So, um, Vuex is state management. Uh, if you've been using Redux or something like that, um, uh, it will be quite similar. Uh, and just by creating this fault, this file, um, we automatically configure Vuex and enable it uh, in our Nux project. So we could simply say uh, export const state is, and we export a function because uh, Nux runs on the server side. So it's important not to share the object between requests. Uh, don't worry. That is spelled out in both the Vuex and the Nux doc docs. Uh, but we might say um, give us some state to start with. And that's all you need to do to configure uh, Vuex. You might also want things like actions. Um, and you can do all your normal actions. There's a special one for, for Nux called Nux server in it, which runs uh, every, uh, every time a request comes in. You can do some stuff to set up your app. Uh, maybe an initial request to an API that you need to make, maybe to verify or authenticate the user, um, stuff like that. Uh, and then there's some other, other folders that are um, more convention uh, rather than um, necessity. So you can, for example, um, if you need to integrate a library, like uh, maybe you have Google Analytics, or you might want to um, use Vue uh, Ally uh, or something like that, um, you can create a plugin. Um, so we can we can create a plugin, uh, just call it test, and that will just export a function. And I can do things in that function, um, which run every request. So that might be something like uh, I might import view, uh, and I might then uh, import um, I haven't installed this, but um, you might do something like this. And that's uh, an, a way of basically um, automatically getting some um, some pretty cool uh, integrations. All I'd need to do to make that work is simply add that plugin to my plugins array in uh, in Nuxt config, 
and it would be set up. Um, there we go. So um, if we are wanting to make a um, pages that are slightly more or routes that are slightly more complex than the ones we have, uh, we can uh, create parent routes um, with children. So for example, we might have a, uh, a file called, uh, we'll change it about to to-dos, and then we might have a directory which has um, an individual uh, to-do. And we want to be able to, to render this for um, with some wrapper text. So here we can have a list of to-dos. Uh, we could then have a Nuxt child uh, component. Um, and if we then in this dynamic page display a single uh, to-do, uh, then Nuxt would automatically make that into the uh, router configuration that Vue requires uh, in order to have a parent root with a child. Um, so that if you visit that, um, that slug to do's forward slash anything you like, it's going to render the parent and the child. Uh, and in the child, we're going to be able to access the ID, uh, the dynamic ID with something like this root params ID automatically. Uh, it's really cool. So that that JSON that you just showed in the .NET Nuxt file that was created automatically. Yes, this is Look Lily, by cat. the way. Hello, Lily. She yeah. uh, is naturally very interested in uh, the view router. Um, yes, so so this it this is um, is is created autom automatically whenever I save anything or do anything. It's created by the dev server um, right now. And it's it's used by the dev server to uh, to render my view app. So if you were wanting to explore, you could see you could open app.js. You could see what the the root view application is, and um, you could see some of the clever helper functions that Nuxt has for you. I don't want to uh, dive in too deep because you can get very deep. There's a lot of stuff that Nuxt does under the hood to set everything up and just make it work. Um, but uh, but yes, that's all happening in this .nux folder. You don't need to know anything about it, um, but it's uh, it is there. Um, but since you've asked about about how that works, um, actually our app will not work because we now do not have you a ally. If you um, if you want to see how you might actually go about doing more than just uh, developing with a Nux app. Um, you'll want to do one or two, you'll want to add one or two scripts to your package JSON um, because Nux can do quite a lot of, of interesting things. Uh, so obviously we have our, our development script, which is just running Nux. Uh, we can also generate a, um, a static site. So if I were to, um, this is, this is often, this is, really, really useful, um, particularly with providers like Versal or Netlify, who have generous free tiers and allow you to, to deploy something uh, very easily. Um, if I have a, a static target, I can simply run uh, not generate. And what it will do is it will run the Webpack build for me, optimize all my code, and then visit every route in my site and pre-render it uh, for me. So it's, uh, it's run a Webpack build here, and then it's uh, generated these routes. It's created this dist folder with um, my index HTML, a fallback HTML, which I can serve for any um, unknown page, like uh, a dynamic route. You typically just need to configure that in your hosting provider. Uh, and then all the JavaScript that you require. Um, and it has some other cool features too. Uh, but basically, that's all done for you automatically, and that can just then be dropped uh, up for a server rendered type experience, but without a server. Uh, you can also uh, run, you can also start a, uh, um, you run a build uh, and a start command. You'll want to run those one after the other. You can generate a built version of your site that's optimized for production and then just fire up a server that serves that uh, and handles each request as it comes in. That would be incredibly simple to do. Um, so 
that would be the website. It's running with um, low memory usage, but it won't have any hard module reload or anything like that. Now, Nux is not just front-end framework, uh, but it also lets you do lots of other things too. So for example, I might want an API. So uh, I will get a to-do API. Um, I can create a normal uh, connect style, express style um, middleware. So something like, uh, what will I do? I'll return anyone wants to correct my uh, memory, then feel free to do that. I think that should do the trick, don't you think? Uh, and I can then just add a uh, something called server middleware in my Nux config. This will actually just add um, a server endpoint to my front end application. And one of the things about Nux that is so um, cool, useful, is that it runs in multiple environments. So with an SPA, that only runs in the browser. But Nuxt runs in more places than, a, than the browser. Um, and this is typically described by the, the, the adjective isomorphic. So um, it, it's meant to run using the same code in more than one place. So it runs on your node server uh, and it also runs in your browser. And actually with the work we've been doing for Nuxt 3, we have a new rendering engine called Nitro, which is actually going to be backported uh, so people can use it in Nuxt 2. It runs everywhere, including it can run the server-side code in web workers, on Cloudflare workers, um, uh, even uh, on Dino, places without a typical node uh, server. So, um, but server middleware basically allows you to hook into this feature. So you could do things within a Nuxt app that can only be done on a server, such as use private uh, keys or config that you don't want to expose to your end client. Um, or you might access the file system, including writing stuff to the file system. Um, and it's all quite seamless. Uh, and and, and uh, so in this case, we are actually, we'll actually use this, a slight shorthand and just say uh, our path is going to be API to do's. And we want that to be handled with uh, API to do's.js. And now, if I've done that correctly, I should be able to hit. API to do's, yep, and I'm getting back exactly the object that I want. Um, in my Nux app, I might consume that many kind, uh, in lots of different ways. Um, in, there's a special Nux hook called fetch, uh, which allows you to um, hook into server prefetching, which is a relatively new feature of view. So um, imagine I have something called uh, to do's there, and I want to, to fetch it. So this to do's, I'll make it easy is await uh, fetch, not this fetch. Uh, what am I going to fetch? This um, try to do this, right? And great. I think that should work for me. Uh, and then maybe let's display the list of to-dos, right? So um, before, oh no, it's not. I created a terrible, let's make this an array. Uh, so we're going to get an array back. So we're going to want to do and to do's. Uh, key is going to be to do. Sorry, this is just boilerplate view. Uh, and we're just going to print to do dot test. So what we want is to fetch actual endpoint. This is right. There we go. Um, so we now have a, an, an array being fetched on the server. Uh, and that will also be the same if I navigate uh, on the client side. So for example, if I'm here on this uh, to-dos page, 
which bears no resemblance whatsoever to any sort of functional to-do app, um, we can actually create something called a Nuxt link, which is a, a view router link with more features um, to the uh, home page. To, for example, it will prefetch the JavaScript that's required uh, to render that page when that link comes into the, the viewport. Um, so we could go home and what we would find uh, if we did that uh, would be um, that we're going to render the home page, and almost instantaneously that um, data is going to be fetched. Now, here's the cool thing: we're in a dev server, and we're just um, we're playing around with this. If we were to generate our package this way, so effectively we have a little API that we've created, and we could swap that out for some paid API that you've got your CMS or something. Um, we can actually uh, generate our app. Um, and because I've selected a static target, um, it's actually going to run that query in advance for me, um, create a payload file with the results of that query. And now as I navigate through the pages of my app, it's not going to fetch, it's not going to call my API anymore. It's actually going to call my uh, stored payload file uh, and it's going to produce something for me, which is, uh, which has all of my, oh, I was unable to fetch it. It's my own fault. Let's do this, something else. It's actually going to do that for me. So as I navigate through the app, um, I'm able to, to, to um, access that without incurring extra API costs or limits. Um, that's an incredibly powerful uh, tool. It's not suitable for every use case, but if it is, then the static target uh, option is likely what you want. Um, there we go. That's the result of my API call. Now, uh, Tipper code is giving that back to me. Um, but that isn't all. Um, so there's other stuff I could say in terms of the, uh, the directory structure. So we've got a static folder where you can just put files that you want to be served up directly like your fav icon or robots text. But one of the most powerful features of Nuxt is its module support. So uh, if you were to go to modules.nuxtjs.org, um, you'll see a list of modules. Um, these are tools that integrate with Nuxt. Um, so whether that's uh, you need to add progressive web app support uh, with a manifest and generating icons for different devices, or whether you want to add TypeScript support, uh, or whether you want to add Tailwind CSS or Vuetify or Axios or um, I18N support, or whether you want to um, add the composition API or an integration with a favorite CMS or whatever. Um, it's all really extensible. Um, so not only could you um, pull in any of these, some of which are sort of first party created by Nuxt maintainers, others of which are out in the community, you can also create your own modules pretty easily and hook into every aspect of Nuxt. Um, so you can make it entirely yours. And this is a very powerful um, way to, to um, extend Nuxt or add functionality to it. Um, I see there's some questions coming in. Alistair, is there anything I should know before I carry on? No, not right now. I've, I've asked all the, the, the sort of more pertinent ones at the moment. Okay, um, great. So what we might want to do um, with uh, an app like this is say install the Composition API, which um, we've uh, already talked about in terms of view three. Now Nux is, Nux3 is just around the corner, by the way. Um, it it's, um, probably will see a public uh, beta uh, sometime in the next month, um, which is going to be pretty exciting. Um, but you can you can experiment with the Composition API already. Um, so here's how you would install a module. And this would be true for any kind of module, whether it's Axios or the Composition API or TypeScript. You're simply going to add it. Most of them are dev modules, which means they, um, they can be run at build time only. Um, and that's by far the best um, option. Um, simply going to paste that. Uh, and then all we need to do is add it to our build modules uh, in our Nuxt config. Uh, in this case, it is. Okay. And now we can write um, we can write in this new syntax that we were shown earlier. So actually now instead of um, using data, for example, 
we could make this whole thing set up set up function. Uh, and we might pull in uh, ref define component, which is a new way of type hinting the shape of a uh, the shape of a um, of a view component. So it, it gives you um, useful data. And this would be a sort of way of doing that in the composition API. Um, so that's not going to print anything because we haven't um, filled it, but it is running just as you might expect. The um, uh, so there there are other cool integrations. So there's something called Nuxt Image, which we've only just released this last week, uh, and I'll show you that. Uh, and there's something else called uh, Nuxt Content, which you might have come across before. I'll install those. Uh, both at the same time. So uh, Nuxt image is a built-in, uh, a drop-in replacement for the normal image uh, component that takes a lot of the hard work out of um, optimizing images for you. Such so it will generate uh, source sets uh, based on the data you provide, and it has built-in providers for um, some of the services you might use, like uh, Cloudinary or Imagex or others. Um, there's even a, a sort of self-hosted a version that will transform your images um, on the fly from a massive source image to something that's much uh, smaller. We're going to create an assets directory uh, and we're going to pop some images into that. Okay. Uh, and we have something called random, which we'll call image one. Is that a ping? It's a JPEG. And we'll do the same for image. Let's just make sure that they're beautiful. Um, okay, so now if we want to configure next image, it's exactly the same really as any other uh, build module. Do check the docs for these kind of things if you're if you're using them. Uh, oh, and I should probably stop. Over once more. Uh, and in our index page, we might want to, for example, display one of these images. So we'll have something like a next image, uh, and we actually will stick that those in a static directory. So we can just access it with forward slash. And we should see now our image. Um, and if we are inspecting that, um, you'll see it's uh, it's our full-sized image. Um, if we want to have a width, say, of 200, uh, we can do that. Uh, and now we have not just has the image width changed, but in fact, the actual size of the image has changed as well to optimize that. Uh, the great thing about that is if we're, say, generating a static site, we can do this at generate time rather than on demand. But if you're using a service like Cloudinary or self-hosted IPX, we can actually do this on uh, runtime as well. Um, if we wanted to produce um, some sizes, so if we wanted to say uh, at uh, medium size, this should be 250 um, PX and uh, at large, let's make it 500, um, then that will actually produce uh, an array of sizes and uh, uh, source set for us with all the different possible with some different possible options based on the default uh, config for an image, which means your browser can pick the one that's most relevant for you. Um, right, I'm probably boring you with next image. There's lots of cool features that it offers um, and it really is a super important if you're wanting to pursue that 100 uh, lighthouse score. Uh, another feature, um, the other module that we installed, which I mentioned is uh, called next content. And that is basically if you want to build a blog, for example, or somehow uh, treat Markdown on your file system like an API, uh, you can do that with Nuxt content. So we could create a folder called content, create a folder called articles, and we could have uh, article one, we could have uh, article two, 
let's give them some front matter. Um, and do that for both of them. And in your in a Nux component, you would then be able to, um, to, to say, pull that in. So if we were to use fetch, we could say, It's as simple as that. Um, so we now have this thing called articles, and we're going to say uh, to do an articles, forgive that, to do dot title. And we now should have the titles from those articles. And you could do the same with body um, content. Uh, you can embed view components, all kinds of other cool things. But I'm aware I may be going down the rabbit hole. Um, and I'm, I'm sure my time is coming up, but I'm, I'm, Alistair is going to have to rein me in because I, I, I'll totally go on forever. I could listen to you forever, so it, like we're in a bit of a problem here. Uh, but that, that's brilliant. Thank you, Daniel. Um, sorry, sorry. What was it that you said about Cloudinary? What, what's Cloudinary? So, um, so the the next image module uh, has a number of providers uh, built in. Uh, so, Cloudinary is one of those. Uh, Cloudinary is a service that um, is effectively a digital asset management. It will store your images for you. You can request them in different sizes. Uh, you can actually perform transformations on them, cropping, um, all done through the URL that you, um, you request. Uh, and the same is true with all these other providers as well. So Fastly and ImageKit and ImageX and Netlify has one and Prismic and Sanity. And so, and so there's lots of providers, people that do that. Uh, and Nuxt Image basically integrates with that. So all I would need to do is say, is pass some configuration. Um, and I think Cloudinary has a couple of options that I need to provide. So I need to give them a base URL, which matches my, um, my account. Uh, and that's all I would need to do. And then at that point, I would be pulling in data from Cloudinary rather than from my project. Gotcha. No, so, so, so that's why you need that to be at runtime at that point, because obviously you don't want to be statically serving that. Right, that makes exactly. Sense. That that yeah that would be it at runtime if if i don't have a provider um, and i have a server um it's still going it's going to, to dynamically um resize it at runtime for me it's going to inject a server handler called this ipx handler which you may have seen underscore ipx uh, uh jpeg and you can see i'm just pulling the headers in my shell being too smart for me if I'm just pulling the headers in, you can see it's returning an image, uh, a JPEG. Um, so it's, it's actually doing that, doing that live. And it's, it's creating my own image resizing um, serverless function for me. Um, so I, I can deploy with that to a server. Or if I actually just generate the app, it will um, resize the image, all the images that I need in all the different sizes that I need um, so that they can be um, pulled smartly by the browser. But obviously, if you have got a lot of images, um, generating them at build time is, might not be the way to go. So often, it, it can be really better to do that at runtime, because then you have your runtime provider, your digital asset provider, caching them for you and handling all the, the specialized um, work that they need to do. But you'll see, if I have a look in my um, next images, I've produced the two different sizes of image that we want. So. Um, Brilliant. Thanks so, so much, Daniel. Um, I, it, like, there have been no specific questions in the chat, um, if, except the ones that I asked. Oh, uh, just before I get to yours, Horace, um, I wanted to just pick up on something Tam said, which I thought was really interesting, which was how how Nuxt would play with uh, Ionic that Phil mentioned earlier. Have you seen any projects that are using those two together? I have. So um, the first place always to start, by the way, is modules, um, with the Nuxt modules list, uh, which is not exhaustive, by the way, there are others. Um, and so I've, uh, so Ionic has a number of parts to it. Um, one of the parts, this isn't Ionic per se, 
but it depends why you're using Ionic. So I've, I've integrated Nuxt with Capacitor before. Um, Nuxt, uh, so there are a number of, of basically view components that can be used in Nuxt from Ionic. Um, but my own experience is, is using Capacitor, which is produced by the same people as Ionic. Sorry, I was muted. Great stuff, thanks. Um, I, I think I think we've got a few questions from Horace, but Zoom has done something weird in the chat, so so I'll try and ask them as best as I can. Um, right. Uh, so so how would you do roots with arbitrary numbers of nesting levels, like um, slash uh, slug one slash slug two, etc.? Is that something? It's possible. So um, obviously you. Um, so effectively, we, we don't know um, how many slugs something might have. So in this case, I'll fire up the dev server again. In this case, if I were just to swap out the um, underscore ID, which matches a single parameter called ID with something which is a single underscore only, that's our basically our wildcard catch-all root. Um, so in this case, I would say, uh, let's just display what this dollar sign root thing is a, uh, a way of accessing the, the view router root. So if I were to say, I would like to know the, uh, the params, and we're just gonna stringify those so we can, can see them. Uh, and that's to do's, whatever, so. You'll see that what's coming up here is rather than a, a named parameter, we're getting test another root as our parameter for path match. Uh, and the way that's turning up in the view router configuration uh, is using the uh, star, the wildcard um, root. So that will match any number of, of um, flashes beyond that point. Very cool. I hope that answered your question, Horace. Um, uh, he's also asking if there, if you have any comments about Jamstack and incremental builds. Uh, Jamstack and what? Sorry, incremental builds. Yeah, yeah. So um, Jamstack, I think, is an incredibly powerful uh, model. I guess we um, may all be interested or, or uh, converted uh, at this point. Um, I would say if you can get away with statically generating your app, um, that's best. Um, the more things you can move to um, edge nodes, the better. Um, better experience for users, they cache better, um, and you're able to stay in control of your build process. Um, the, uh, so next, the next three rendering en engine, this thing called Nitro, which I could actually demo for you if you're really interested, is um, basically enables stat uh, incremental builds. So a lot of that is dependent on the provider. So how, how they offer that, because, so what are you saying when you're talking about an incremental build? There is an initial build phase, right? So we, we create the app, we create the server, we, um, but then what happens when you request, say, uh, in this case, we have got a, um, an arbitrary matching pattern. We can't generate all of that in advance. So um, the typical pattern with a static app is to create a rule which matches any unmatched um, route to a fallback page, which just loads a normal view SPA app, which handles that. Is this a matched route? Then it sort of figures out, okay, it should be rendered with underscore.view. What are we going to do? We're going to do that from scratch in the browser. Um, but that doesn't cache, right? So that's being done by every person's browser all the time. So with incremental static regeneration, what we do, uh, or generation, what we do is we say, um, the server is going to render that single pay, that single route, and then it's going to cache it and remember it from now on. Um, so that procedure is basically very dependent on the provider. So Netlify have something called uh, distributed persistent rendering, which they've just released. Um, Versal have a feature, um, which is probably what you'll be familiar with from Next.js on running on Versal, which is incremental static uh, generation. Nitro supports that. Um, so when that and that comes out, you'll have uh, you'll be able to see see that in action. But it is highly dependent on, on the provider because what has to happen is it has to hit a server endpoint. Um, Next has to generate that route, and then the provider has to cache and save that route. So all future 
uh, visits to it get rendered that HTML rendered. So it's um, brilliant. Thanks, man. Um, uh, just uh, like we've, we've got a couple more questions from Horace, but does does anyone want to come off mute? Are there any other questions that anyone wanted to ask before I close? No? Okay, cool. Um, so Horace is also asking if in Nux3 you they'll combine async data and fetch into one thing. Do you know if that's going to be the case? Yes, that is the case. So um, the so in, in Nux3, so at the moment, so Horace, clearly you know Nux um, uh, because I haven't even mentioned async data. So async data is um, it's basically uh, an asynchronous function, the output of which uh, gets merged with your data. So um, in, in Vue, you start your component off with some data. But what if you need to perform some kind of fetch, um, as we were doing an index page? You could use the fetch um, that I've done here. Um, the thing about that is it's done synchronously on server side. But if you're navigating from uh, on the client side, and you haven't generated your app in advance, then that's going to happen as you navigate. So it's, it's not going to block the page navigation. Um, what async data does, um, it only works for pages because it has to um, use view router hooks to, to make this work, but it actually blocks navigation to the next page until that data fetching has happened, which means you can render a fully, um, a fully rendered um, view which has all the data it needs to render. So you don't ever have a load it, you don't ever have to have a loading state if you're using async data. Um, often that's great. Sometimes it is better to display a loading state because it can feel snappier to the user. They click the button and it instantly changed and there's still the loading and then everything is there rather than clicking a button and they wait a second and then everything is there. So it, it depends on your app. Um, with Nux3, yes, there's going to be a new uh, function, which uh, it, there's a new async data basically, which has both blocking and non-blocking implementations. So you can basically uh, block page navigation if you need to, or you can uh, have a more fetch-like uh, behavior. So I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Daniel. Um, we've had a question about Nitro. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. So uh, Nitro uh, is so it's it's a it's a when I say a rendering engine, it's the thing that transforms a request into HTML. So it decides what's coming back when you ask for a page. Um, it's it's a it's a server. So um, it is. There are a number of features about it, but it's basically optimized for today's serverless world. So rather than having a big monolithic server, which sits in memory for a long period of time and has to be optimized to take lots and lots of different requests and return them, um, you know, return them correctly and so on, uh, but, but can rely on there being lots of stuff in known modules. Uh, it can rely on having a whole operating system around it. It can rely on all these sorts of things. Um, more and more, we need to be able to produce tight, lean, minimal builds that has that have nothing more than is necessary. So Nitro is reinventing the server for Nuxt. So we've mocked lots of Node APIs so that Nitro isn't dependent on Node. Um, and in fact, lots of libraries that people might use that uh, wrap Node or add extra, uh, extra uh, fluff, we, we mock them throughout your dependency tree to get rid of them. Uh, and, uh, and Nitro then is able to, to respond to incoming requests. At its core, and this may be getting into too much detail, so please honestly feel free to yawn or whatever, but uh, at its core, Nitro is, uh, is a, um, almost a uh, telephone exchange. So your, your request comes in and uh, Nitro knows the, um, whether it can handle that or not. Um, so, if it, if, it, if it matches that request, then it will lazy load the JavaScript that's needed to respond to that request. So there's not a sort of sense of everything is always loaded. Um, we're optimizing for fast cold start times. So there's this tiny, tiny um, exchange um, router that basically decides whether or not we can respond to something, lazy loads the code that's necessary to respond, and then responds to it. 
Um, it's got some cool features. So for example, within your um, app, you can fetch data from other bits of your app. So if you were in your index.view file and you needed to fetch from your own API endpoint, um, you could do that without causing another network request. Nitro would intercept that request, know that it could handle it itself, um, and just call the function that is necessary to return the response. So you get this incredibly fast um, uh, response for bits of your app. Um, Nitro um, works on Versal and Netlify and Azure and AWS Lambda um, and Cloudflare workers. It's, um, it works everywhere basically, um, which, which, basically, which is our effort to move things to the edge. That's not to say that you should always use Nitro. I mean, if you can get away with a static site um, and pre-built HTML, then do that because that's always going to trump a server. But Nitro is, is, is as close as we can get to making a server as lean and light as possible. Very interesting. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm just gonna take sort of one or two more questions um, because time marches on. Uh, Daniel Van Berzon is asking if there's a built-in testing library. So um, you can. There's not a built-in testing library now. Um, you can use view test utils to test your components. Oh, I didn't even tell you about components. I can't believe that. Um, well, I, I, Alistair, you said this is the last question. I'm going to take full advantage of that. So you can use uh, view, but I will try and answer the question as well. So you can use a view test utils to test your components just as you normally would in a view app. And uh, there is also a, a library that um, we're just putting together called Nuxt test utils that lets you test things that rely on the framework. So stuff like uh, the fetch hook. View isn't going to do anything with that. That's not a view hook. Um, so if you're trying to test its behavior, you're not going to be able to do that with Vue. But we can we provide this Nux test utils library that lets you um, take uh, just simulate a request in your test. Say I, I want the page for forward slash um, about, uh, and Nux will then do everything that it would normally do. So load the plugins, um, open load in the modules, whatever is required, um, register all the components, and give you a response. Uh, and you can then either inter interact with that in the browser um, in a, a playwright instance, or you can also interact with that uh, in a node instance and just inspect the HTML and, and do whatever you need to do with that. So it's basically more of an end-to-end -end, uh, framework. Um, the thing that I should have mentioned um, is that Nux has this uh, really powerful <laughs> feature, uh, which is uh, the components folder. So if you create a, a component, um, and uh, I'm, I'm so imaginative of my components, right? If you create a component uh, and then you just want to, we'll call it something else about item, and then you want to use that elsewhere in your project, you don't need to import it. Um, you can just use it straight away. Um, and Nuxt will learn that uh, it will know that it's being, it's not going to import it globally. Uh, it, it will know that it's needed to be imported only in that file, um, and it will actually uh, import it for you. Um, so about component is there. And then when you build the app, um, it actually puts those imports in the right places. So it's super from a development ergonomics point of view. Thank you.